Hello. This 28-minute video will give you basic information about Warrant Article 5, introduced by the Town's Clean Energy Future Committee, endorsed by the Select Board, and sponsored by the resident group Clean Heat for Arlington. The following are three segments from the two-hour public information session held at Town Hall on February 27th, 2020, where we hosted speakers that addressed energy, heating, and cooling, affordable housing and climate change issues related to the warrant article. The article last winter was number 13, but it's been refiled for this fall town meeting as article number five. However, its content is substantially the same as it was last winter when we prepared these segments. Hi everyone, thanks again for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Amos Meeks. I'm the co-chair of Sustainable Arlington, as well as one of the sort of steering team members for this um, Clean Heat for Arlington group. Um, I'm gonna do a sort of quick overview of the bylaw and sort of the um, concretely what we're proposing, um, just so that we all have sort of a common basis. And then I'm gonna try to sort of allay some of the common concerns that we've seen up front, but a lot of these things will we'll go into more detail as we go um, through it, and we sort of welcome all sorts of questions during the Q&A session. Um, so the main meat of this bylaw, um, what we are proposing is prohibiting new fossil fuel piping. Um, so it's important to notice that this is specifically affecting the piping in new construction and um, gut rehabilitation, so major rehabilitations that are sort of the level where you're um, gutting the entire house and it's essentially like new construction. So what this means is that um, existing buildings are entirely unaffected. Um, you know, smaller renovations, kitchen renovations, bathroom renovations, any of those things, there's no effect whatsoever um, and additions are also entirely unaffected. Um, next. Um, so that's kind of the meat. Uh, we also include a number of sort of uh, common sense and practical um, exemptions. Um, so I think if we, was this the first one or was it? Um, okay, so we, uh, first of all, this only affects things on the customer side of the meter. So this has nothing to do with sort of utilities, nothing in sort of the private right of, private right of way. It's all just um, from the meter and in the house. Um, there is an exemption for backup generators. Um, there is, you know, portable propane appliances, things that are not sort of attached to the house's fossil fuel piping. Those are completely unaffected. Um, and then also all gas cooking appliances are um, sort of exempted. So you can still have fossil fuel piping for um, a gas stove or oven. And um, restaurants, which often rely on gas, um, are sort of exempted for those. Um, in addition, uh, there's an exemption for, you know, work being done to repair or deal with any unsafe piping. Um, their uh, hot water for large buildings is exempted um, just because sort of the, the technology to do that efficiently um, with electricity is not there yet. But there is sort of a clause in there that if the cost of these technologies um, come down and become comparable with gas, um, then they, that will, hot water for large buildings will also sort of fall under the scope of the bylaw. Um, research and medical facilities are exempted. Um, and then finally, because this has to do with the fossil fuel piping, there's no effect on kind of the non-fossil fuel piping related to a heating system. So um, if you need to um, extend an existing heating system, um, you can do anything you want with sort of the water pipes, that sort of things that is not affected by this bylaw. But again, um, this is only this only really affects uh, new construction, in which case you're installing a whole new system anyways, um, or a gut rehabilitation, which in most of the cases, um, you're taking out the old heating system and, and installing a new one. Um, but in the case where you didn't take out the whole he heating system, you could still um, extend and modify the non-fossil fuel piping side of things. Um, okay, so now to quickly kind of cover a few common questions. Um, one of the first things that people often ask uh, when hearing about this is, um, you know, because so much of our electrical grid generation comes from natural gas, um, is there actually a, uh, a benefit in terms of emissions to switching to a heat pump? And the answer is sort of definitively yes. Um, there's a pretty um, significant immediate um, reduction in emissions of um, roughly half plus give or take. Um, but really the sort of 
what you'll hear about later, the context for this is we're thinking ahead to the future and we're thinking ahead to our goal of being net zero by 2050. And so um, as the grid as a whole moves towards this net zero goal, um, heat pumps have sort of lower, lower emissions related to them, whereas natural gas and other fossil fuel heating in your home um, doesn't really change and continues to uh, have a fairly high amount of emissions. Um, the next question that a lot of people ask is, you know, does this cost a whole lot? Um, it's, at the end of the day, it really depends on the individual building situation. Um, but uh, a study was done for um, MassSave that compared sort of a model natural gas home uh, with a model heat pump home. And what they found is basically the cost difference in terms of insulation is um, less than $1,000. Um, and that's not taking into account sort of current generous incentives and that sort of thing. So in the overall cost of a building for new construction, um, $1,000 is, is not really um, significant. And then in terms of the sort of operating cost, they found the cost difference was um, around uh, $40 um, per month, which um, compared to, so this is for a home that would cost um, over $1 million uh, for new construction. So when compared to the other monthly costs that, that are associated with that in terms of the, the mortgage, um, taxes, et cetera, um, this increased cost is about less than 1% of the total monthly costs. costs. Um, so that's, it's a fairly small impact. Um, and again, that sort of doesn't uh, account for um, various incentives, cheaper to install, um, things like that. Um, then the other two sort of things, um, you might wonder about affordable housing. So what I talked about before, those were costs for you know, new construction in Arlington, relatively large single family home, 3,000 square foot home. Um, people who are you know, buying that are buying like a million, $1.2 million house. Um, for those who maybe can't afford to uh, pay any extra costs associated with this, um, affordable housing is actually already leading the way. Um, and we'll hear more about this from um, Bev and Bob later. But these are two sort of um, example, nearby examples. There's um, one currently being constructed, uh, Finch Cambridge, which has 98 affordable housing units and uses um, entirely um, heat pump heating. And then the O'Shea House in Brookline, um, which is a housing authority property and has 100 units of affordable housing and also uses entirely heat pump heating. And this is, you know, without any of these existing bylaws, this is just already in our current system. It actually just makes sense to um, use this for affordable housing. And then um, at the end of the day, the total impact of this um, is expected to be relatively small. Um, so the planning department did kind of an estimation of what is the total number of buildings that could possibly be impacted, and they found that it was um, about 70 buildings, buildings per year on average. Um, you know, some years that might be higher, some years that might be lower, um, but we're talking sort of roughly um, half a percent of Arlington's total sort of 15,000 building, uh, building stock. Um, but then uh, one more thing I want to say before we move on to Corley is that even with all of these exemptions, um, if there is uh, kind of anything um, that's an issue, we do, there is built in a waivers and appeals process. So if there's anything that has an undue burden that's not sort of already taken care of, there's a process to, to sort of get that waived. Um, the goal here is really to be very practical and economical and not create an undue burden on anyone. So now, Corley. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Jeremy Koo. Uh, I was invited by uh, by Ken Ken Prude with the Town of Arlington and the other members of the uh, committee to give a bit of a primer tonight. I know there's a lot of uh, um, heat pumps as a technology have changed a lot in just just the last five years. Um, we've really seen a remarkable shift in how uh, homes, technologies, and and such are now available today. Uh, so. Um, I was asked to give sort of a, a quick primer on uh, what exactly we're talking about as the alternative uh, to gas in these buildings. Uh, speak a little bit more about, you know, Arlington is not the only town that's considering this and certainly not the only uh, town in the Northeast that is installing heat pumps at a very rapid and quickly accelerating pace. Um, and then also take a little bit of a deeper dive into the actually the cost, cost example that uh, I think Amos and I were looking at the same report uh, that we pulled from uh, that was done by NMR last year on incremental costs in new construction. Um, so 
for folks who are not familiar, a heat pump is really, it, it fundamentally is a technology. I'm not going to go through the, the actual like diagram and the, and the uh, uh, thermodyn thermodynamics behind it, but it's, if, the best way to think about it is it's, you have the same technology in your home already. It's in your refrigerator. What is your refrigerator doing? It's extracting, keeping heat out of a space that's cold and pushing it out into somewhere that's warmer. Um, and another way to think about it is it's an air conditioner that can run in reverse. It's trans transferring heat from the outdoor air into your building and then vice versa when acting, in, when acting in a cooling capacity. I think I animated this, unfortunately. Oh, uh, So um, there are a lot of different heat pumps that are available. Um, just, I think you hit it a couple of times. Um, there are uh, air source heat pumps. I think a lot of the examples that have been mentioned so far our air source heat pumps, there are a couple of examples of residential scale heat pumps that have been installed in Massachusetts in the last few years. Uh, uh, Amos had mentioned uh, variable refrigerant flow, VRF heat pumps, which are um, a, commercial, a commercial scale version of these uh, heat pumps that are available. And they, there's are a variety of options that are available that can uh, work in any sort of uh, building configuration. Uh, ground source uh, or geothermal heat pumps are another option that are available, uh, taking advantage of the fact that in a lot of new construction, uh, there's a lot more space to work with, uh, fewer existing obstacles, and being able to plan around uh, using the ground as a, more, as a very efficient and constant uh, source of heat and uh, for, for both heating and for cooling in the summer. Uh, is, a, is an even more efficient way of heating and cooling a building. Uh, water heaters are the third uh, example of heat pumps that have been uh, uh, brought up here. Um, in this case, since the uh, proposed article excludes larger buildings, this is primarily an appliance that is going to be working in smaller residential capacities, uh, but it's effectively taking the components of a heat pump and putting it on top of an existing water heater, and it's a, and otherwise Fits in, fits in a basement like any other, uh, any other um, storage water heater. Um, there are a few common misconceptions, I think, about electric heat. I think um, when you think about both heat pumps and about heating with electricity, um, you know, electric, electric resistance heating is inherently not very efficient and very expensive to heat with. Um, you know, the electric grid is somewhere between 30 to 40 percent efficient, and so even though you know, that, and that's what drives electric heat to be particularly expensive. Um, what's being, you know, in, in limiting the use of fossil fuels in new construction, the push is towards heat pumps, which are transferring heat and using, using electricity to transfer heat from one space to another, not to actually create heat. So whereas an electric resistance baseboard or space heater is what we would call 100% efficient, have a coefficient of performance of one, air source heat pumps throughout the year will range from about 220 to 350 or more uh, percent efficient, and ground source heat pumps th from 350 percent efficient and up. So not only is that does that result in, a, you know, it's, a lot of folks will say that um, burning gas at the power plant level means that using electricity is actually less efficient than burning gas at home. When you take those efficiencies into account, it's actually a more efficient use of the gas being burned at the power plant level than being burned on site your, in your home. Um, so another, another one, uh, misconception, uh, which is uh, the one that uh, my mother said when I told her I started working on heat pumps over five years ago, uh, is that heat pumps don't work in the Northeast. Um, the, you know, in, and conventionally, this has, been, this has been true. Heat pumps are uh, a very common uh, heating and cooling technology being used in the South and the Mid-Atlantic right now. There's, I think, I think 20... I think it was 28 million homes that use heat pumps across the South right now, primarily as air conditioning and a bit of heating, given their climate. Uh, heat pumps historically have not been effective at performing, well, air source heat pumps at least, have been ineffective at performing at temperatures below 30 or 40 Fahrenheit. Um, NEEP, the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships, uh, administers a uh, certification program for heat pumps uh, to be cold climate. Uh, which means that they have to maintain air source heat pumps have to maintain uh, efficiencies of of at least 175 percent at five degrees, of which um, all but about 30 to 40 hours per year in a typical year in Arlington are above. And you know, like it or not, it's uh, that that may shrink more and more from year to year. Uh, so NEEP, NEEP certifies a lot of cold climate heat pumps, and those have been primarily the models that have been installed in Massachusetts to date. Um, 
And, uh, you know, one of the other points is that, you know, it's okay, it's great that you're talking, you know, heat pumps are, are, are more efficient, but they're probably not ideal for serving as the only source of heat in a home. Uh, in 2017, which is only f about four years after cold climate heat pumps became a thing uh, in the Northeast, in Massachusetts, 10% of new homes were already using heat pumps as their only source of heating and cooling. That number has only increased since then. Um, we, you know, not to, t to discount ground source heat pumps as well, which have been installed for, for, for decades uh, across the U.S. Uh, these systems are intended to be the sole source of heating and cooling and take advantage of the more consistent heat in the ground to maintain efficiency and their heating output throughout the year, even when, you know, when, it's in, when it's in negative digits. There was a great study that was done about five years ago about ground source heat pumps in Alaska, so they're very much usable here. Um, and then in the HeatSmart Heat Smart Mass program, of which uh, Arlington recently participated in and was, uh, to date, the most uh, successful campaign of any of the 30-something heat, heat Smart campaigns I've supported across the Northeast, uh, dozens, of, uh, dozens of homes uh, opted to retrofit existing buildings with heat pumps with no backup system being used. We can definitely do this in new construction, uh, and, even if, and it's still even possible in retrofits. Um, one other, another data point is that um, this is not something, you know, heat, while, you know, general awareness of heat pumps is relatively low, what we've seen since the State Clean Energy Center began rebating these systems in December of 2014 is that the, is that the number of heat pumps installed have been accelerating from year to year. Between December 2014 and March 2019 when the program ended, over 20,000 cold climate heat pumps were installed, uh, were rebated through the program, and that growth trajectory even came with them reducing the, the rebate twice over, the, over, that, over that time to make the, make the, uh, the budget last longer. So um, they are continuing to accelerate now with even more incentives available through MassSave. Um, Mass is not alone. Uh, Maine was actually one of the first states to begin incentivizing cold climate heat pumps uh, um, starting in 2012. Uh, since then, they've incentivized over 30,000 systems, and the governor recently set a target to increase, uh, increase that even more. Uh, similarly, Vermont, I'm missing about two years of data since it wasn't in their annual reports, but they've also uh, continued to accelerate in Vermont. And New York uh, also similarly has set, set a lot of targets and in two years has rebated over 11,000 uh, heat pump projects. So it's very much a reality in the Northeast um, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it's the, time, the timing is in a lot of ways right for, for the market to have met a lot of the maturity that's needed to be able to uh, drive more successful installations. Um, you know, I wanted to just take a quick look at that, you know, and certainly if you wanted, you know, want to dig up that study, look at it a little bit more. It's called the, you know, mini split uh, incremental cost uh, baseline study. Uh, it was done in 20, uh, late 2018, I believe. Um, it compared uh, what would be the installation of a traditional gas furnace and central AC and a tankless, tankless uh, gas water heater with a mini split air source heat pump and a heat pump water heater uh, in, a new, in new construction in a home that, that's built, built to code. So uh, the installed cost, again, before any incentives that are available, was about $700 in difference out of, you know, I think as Amos was saying, this, for this home it would be about 1.2 million uh, in construction costs. Um, I don't even know if that inc ex included uh, avoided cost of the gas connection. Uh, if you were to eliminate gas entirely, which would be another few thousand dollars that would be removed from that. As far as annual operating costs, uh, I think, as Amos said, it's about $40 a month over the course of the year, higher for uh, the heat pump, and that's just the reflection of uh, gas prices being uh, particularly low and electric costs being particularly high. Uh, but in new construction, there's also uh, both at a, a push at the state code level and also um, in terms of ease, of ease and cost uh, to put rooftop solar on new buildings. And if you were to power all that equipment with solar PV, uh, it would cost, you know, and this is assuming you don't own the system, somebody else owns it and you're just paying for the electricity from it, it would actually result in a net, sa in a savings of $150 a year, no extra in increased cost to do so. So there, there are a lot of, I think there's a lot of opportunity here, um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, given the, you know, and I think the exemptions that are written into the law, uh, the, the, the uh, proposed article uh, cover some of the variations here. As you get into larger buildings, there's different different needs with those buildings, particularly with research facilities and you know larger uh, hot water uses. And so the you know those are 
exempted from this bylaw, but certainly um, I was also looking at the Arlington Assessor data uh, over the last five years. I think about 80% of the buildings were either townhouses or single family homes, so that, that essentially covers the majority of the new construction that will be happening in the near future. Um, and so happy to answer questions uh, at the end of the period. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, actually Jeremy did a great job and covered an awful lot of the stuff that we would normally say, so that's fantastic. Um, well, exa exactly, in, 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 including uh, covering our, own, our programs for us, so, you know, uh, we do appreciate that. Um, we are, so I should just tell you who we are. Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, uh, we are a quasi-government agency uh, funded by a, a, a small surcharge on your retail electric bills, and we use that to run a bunch of programs to encourage clean energy, energy efficiency, uh, startup technologies, et cetera. Wanted to, uh, to say one thing at the outset, that as a government agency, we don't really kind of comment on legislation or things like that, so, uh, but we do certainly encourage the use of all sorts of clean technologies. Air shorts, heat pumps are fantastic. Uh, and, and I want to give you a little just overview of where we've been through this, and, and again, I think Jeremy kind of touched on some of this, but um, we started the ground source heat pump pilot uh, with the uh, Department of Energy Resources, our sister agency, um, back in 2013. Uh, and then um, we uh, committed, uh, what was that, $48 million to uh, our five-year clean heating program. And uh, again, you saw that, that uptake uh, over those years. Um, 2019, we'll skip ahead. Uh, well, we did the Heat Smart, as, 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 and you all participated in that, which was fantastic. And then in 2019, we started the whole home heat pump uh, challenge. So uh, what we've been trying to do uh, with all of our program is just sort of push the envelope, right, and to uh, drive this uh, adoption of what is relatively new technology, that cold climate air source heat pump. And now uh, we have, through that, through our efforts, we've gotten uh, Mass Safe to pick that up, and that's why you know you have this sort of widespread, uh, statewide uh, rebates available uh, through Mass Safe. Uh, then, for uh, for more details, sort of on the technologies and how that affects uh, pr cost, I'm going to just turn it over to Bev. So, Jeremy actually covered. So Jeremy covered a lot of this. I just I want to emphasize again, like one of these myths is that it's it's not going to work in our climate. Totally not true. Alaska, northern Canada, uh, all kinds. Maine. Can you hear me now? Okay. So they they definitely work. No question about it. Um, when we start talking about affordable housing, it's usually multifamily. And when you start looking at first costs, it's even less dramatic of a difference in multifamily. So you're usually in a multifamily building going to cost out about five different heating system options. And at this point, you also need to add cooling. So heat pumps, because they heat and cool, you're not talking about two different systems, you're talking about a combined one. So when you price it out for multifamily new construction, you're usually finding heat pumps in one of the lower two of the five options. Um, so that's first costs, very reasonable, and we're seeing like a huge movement, and it's really only the last two years or so, everything multifamily is going all heat pumps. It's just not even a push to talk to developers about it. They, they go for it very easily. Um, in terms of operating costs, again, when you compare to a single family home, um, stretch code communities, when you build a new construction multifamily, so it's, it's a better envelope, less outside surface area, right? And so it's actually more efficient to be multifamily than single family. Um, and when you have that good envelope, uh, the difference between the electric and gas on the heating is very low. And often multifamily buildings are cooling dominated. So you actually end up cooling, the, the capacity of the system is determined by the cooling and you end up using cooling a decent amount more. So 
cooling with heat pumps is much more efficient than a central air AC. So when you balance the heating and cooling, it tends to be, even just in a stretch code building, um, gonna be about the same. Next slide. Um, so I think you guys already have in the warrant article an exemption for central hot water. And that's really important because heat pump water heaters are great for single family homes and maybe up to about eight units or so. Um, that would be fine, but once you get past that, you're gonna wanna go to a central system in almost all cases. I mean, you could do electric resistance individual tanks for every one, but uh, heat pump water heater technology is not really here yet. It's in Europe, it's in Japan, but it's not really here yet. Um, so I do think having uh, you know, a provision, I, it sounds like you're gonna think about that in the future too, because that may change in the future. Um, the other one thing, we talked in Brookline as well, and I guess um, uh, our agency has sponsored quite a, a bunch of um, passive house affordable housing uh, grants. And so the Finch project that was mentioned is the first one that's being built. Um, but in that process, we've been learning sort of about when you do not have gas in it, what other challenges are there? And I would say the one thing that uh, we didn't mention in Brookline, but I think can be an issue, is heat recovery ventilation. If you don't have any ability to have gas, it may be a decent amount more expensive. Um, so heat recovery ventilation, so the warm air in here, when you exhaust it, instead of just wasting that heat, you should put a heat exchanger in, and you capture 80 to 90% of that heat and preheat the fresh air coming in, right? And then the heating system doesn't have to work very hard. So that's passive house or very high uh, performance buildings in general are gonna use that technology a lot. And again, if you go all electric, it could be a little bit more expensive. So um, next slide. So it's not, we definitely should be thinking about affordability, and I, I'm really glad you guys came and asked us to come speak about affordability. So uh, energy uh, burden for different people of different incomes is really an important issue. So um, most people in Massachusetts spend less than one week of their annual budget on energy costs. Uh, when you get to somebody more middle income, so say a, a one uh, earner family as a teacher, it might be more like two weeks of their annual budget. But when you get to someone below 60% of state median income, it's often a month or even two months. And so that's why affordable housing, or one of the reasons that affordable housing has been on the leading edge of green building, because they're mission driven, they wanna make sure that the energy costs are very low for their tenants, and when they're an owner, they wanna be able to provide more services instead of spending it on energy. Um, next slide. But what we're finding is in new construction, it's really going all electric is not really an additional cost. Like I mentioned before, especially when you calculate the cooling in as well, um, you're talking about sort of a net wash on a new construction building. So as long as the bar for um, uh, requiring or not allowing any gas is a, a, a gut rehab that's a very high level gut rehab where you're gonna be triggering energy code and you're gonna to have to do a lot of envelope improvements, you really shouldn't see a big increase in costs. Um, so I will say, Brookline I think put some kind of exemption in. Um, their housing authority actually was going all electric on a number of their buildings and was not worried about it. But I, there could be examples, I guess, of masonry brick buildings where it's, it's tough to do a lot of uh, envelope improvements. So that might be the one place where your costs might be slightly higher um, if you uh, don't have some kind of appeals process for, for specific ones. Next slide. That's it. So uh, um, I will say um, affordable housing these days is incentivized quite uh, quite a bit for new construction to go to passive house levels. So passive house is basically the most energy efficient standard in the world. It's, it ends up for a multifamily building being about 40% more efficient than what you would standard build. Um, it uses this heat recovery. It, it, rec it has a lot more uh, ventilation, so it's actually more healthy for uh, tenants. Um, but we're also seeing like those projects that would go for low income housing tax credits, they would get more... Um, more points in getting chosen between different projects if they come in with a passive project. So between mass save incentives, which every multifamily in the state should look at, and, 
and uh, those benefits to, to being more likely to get your tax credits, you're going to see a lot of affordable housing going passive. And in that case, they're going to be all electric anyway. All eight of the grants that we provided to passive house projects, they all went with heat pump uh, heating and cooling technology. Thank you for listening to these segments about the Clean Heat for Arlington warrant article, which will be voted on at special town meeting starting November 16th. If you have questions, want more information, or would like to volunteer, please email us at cleanheatforarlingtonma at gmail.com or go to our website, www.cleanheatforarlingtonma.org.